in this class, I, I have pretty extensive code um, to go over with you guys. So I find that in a lot of cases, walking through an example step by step is a lot better than giving you a bunch of rules and then showing the, a simple example. So I'm actually going to teach you the ANOVA step by step as I am running it. Um, and I'm going to give an example of a one-way ANOVA and then later a two-way ANOVA, I will give an example as well. So we will go through this one-way ANOVA very granularly, and then we will do the two-way ANOVA in maybe a little less detail. So as I have told you many, many times in this class, the first thing that you need to do with any example data set um, is to visualize them. Um, you're going to see why in this particular data set in general. So something that you will find very common is there are going to be data entry errors in pretty much any data set that you use, unless it's a public one that has been cleaned quite thoroughly. So this is a great example. The example that I'm going to show is this is not real data. I need to do a disclaimer here. Um, so when I worked at Bayer, um, there are... I have a pretty good domain knowledge of corn in general. So I did a very simple example um, in this case, looking at the yield. So when you look at yield, it's usually measured in bushels per acre. And bushels is looking at the quantity of corn that has been grown in a specific, in the average by acre. So we, in this case, each one of our rows would be one type of corn. And then our yield would be our dependent variable. Um, so we are looking in this case, one thing that we always looked at is the length of the growing season and how that affects different. And, and often it was how we looked at that in the relationship to yield. So that was a very common thing that we did at a very high level. So in this case, I tend to know how this data looks. So in general, not just at Bayer, but at any agriculture company that you have, it's going to follow a similar relationship to this, but this is fake data. I have um, created it, but also modified it so it would look somewhat like the real data that you would see. Um, so in this case, we are looking at growing season length, short, middle, and long. So if you have a short growing season, you're more likely to be, say, in Ohio or a, a Michigan or a, a state north in the United States. The southern states, for instance, uh, Florida, Texas, um, would be considered that, to have a long growing season. So different products would uh, measure up very differently based on uh, the growing season. Maybe certain products need more light than other products. So that's something that you would see very typically in a job example. And I wanted to give one that I was very familiar with so that I could give you data that would look somewhat like you would see in practice. So the first thing that I recommend doing before doing an ANOVA is to create a box plot. I, sh I show this code in, um, and I will show in a second in, in, in R. Um, so the data that I dropped in OneDrive is the data um, with our corn yields and our growing season length. So I created my box plot here. Um, we've gone over this a little bit, um, but I will recap what a box plot does. So this, very, uh, this line right here will always be the median of this particular group. In particular, we're looking at short here. So this would be a short growing season you'll see up here. So what we're seeing here, the line, is our median. Um, so this space right above the median will be our 75th um, percentile. Um, so we are seeing, so we would go from 50, 50th percentile to the 75th percentile will be shown here. So, and often that's referred to as the third quartile. This space below here um, would be below the median or the 50th percentile, but above this 25th percentile. This, they call it a tail, is anything above the 75th percentile will be up here. Anything below the 25th percentile will be on this low tail. 
You'll see when we're specifically looking at middle and long growing seasons, we have these dots here are outliers. So if you need a recap of how you would de define an outlier, there are videos on it. But in this particular case, um, it is the interquartile range um, times 1.5. So the interquartile range would be uh, uh, calculated by taking that 75th percentile minus that 25th percentile um, and then multiplying that by 1.5. If they are higher than that value, it's going to be here. Um, so we would add that uh, that value. Um, and then below here, it's going to be the, a low outlier. So these are high outliers. These are low outliers. So these I wouldn't worry too much about because they're outliers officially, but they're not too far out from the rest of the data. Up here, though, this looks pretty strange. So all of our data is below a 250. Uh, in this case, I will call this bushels per acre. Um, but then there's this weird data point up here that's at 300. Just uh, you guys are not uh, familiar with corn data, but this is probably not physically possible to have a yield that is this high. It would be very rare, and I don't even know if it's possible. I never saw it. So that would be a red flag to you. Usually you would have domain knowledge if you are analyzing data like this. So this looks odd. And I would actually look at this in the data. Um, I'm 99% sure that this is a data entry error, given my domain knowledge. And hopefully you would have that as well. So this would be something that I would absolutely want to remove from my data because it's not real. So I had a lot of questions about whether to keep outliers or remove outliers. This would be a removal scenario because this will highly skew our result and change and bias that result, yet it's probably not actually giving us any actual information that is helpful. So that will help, that'll help show you how to do somewhat of an outlier removal in this case. So this is what I, that would be what I would do. I'm going to go into my code here. So all I'm doing here, um, you will have to install these packages if you don't already have them installed. So that's install.packages. You have parentheses. And then inside of quotes, you have the package name. Um, if you need a review of that, it's on my website under the tutorials tab. So I'm going to read in the data from OneDrive. So this is yield data. I'm actually going to get rid of all my objects just so we can start from scratch here. Um, so we have our yield data. Let's just take a look at this. First, I'm going to um, change these. Uh, so our different levels, we can come down here and look at this. So they're uh, long, middle, and short. Um, in this case, this is ordered. So I would want to, when I am making my factor variable, as we went over in the last uh, class, I would want to make sure short is listed first middle is listed in the middle and long last. Otherwise, it will automatically do it alphabetically and put long first. So just because there's a specific order, I'm gonna change this because all my results will be listed in that order. A great way to get a bird's eye view of your data if you don't wanna click up here is the STR. So we are seeing here that we have a factor variable with growing length and a yield, which is an integer variable that is showing here with our bushels per acre results. This is an example of when you would want to keep your variable as a factor, because when you put it into the ANOVA model, I believe it will force it to be a factor if you don't already do that. So just that is a great example. That's an example of what I was trying to tell you before that if you're putting something into a model, it 99% of the time should be a factor variable. So we showed our table here just to give us an idea of what our um, growing season looks like. Another thing that I would do that I actually didn't add in is to do this summary. And I would do that same yield.df, and I would actually put this yield in here. So we're seeing here that um, our minimum is 173 and our maximum is the 295. This is the main really, really high outlier that we saw. So I'm going to show this again. Um, so the plot is going to come up down here. You're seeing that high outlier. Like I said, that is 99% sure that that's a data entry error. So that's a case that I would want to remove it. 
and the filter variable, the filter function will show you how to do that. Um, if you want to learn more about these, we're actually getting to this next in the next intro to our programming class that I'm having. So we're going to filter that. So now if we go back to the summary um, up here, we're going to see that that 295 variable is now gone because um, I got rid of anything above 270 because it was very clear that this value was above 270. So that's the first thing that I would do. Um, another way to do that, if you want to get more um, statistics, say you want your mean, your, your medium, your standard deviation, and the min and the max. Um, this particular code will show you those and print those values. Um, if you want to know more about this, this is actually already on my website. It is the dplyr, uh, it, the dplyr uh, class that I did, although this is an intermediate level class. I do not recommend it for beginners. But that's all that does is to take our mean, our median, our standard deviation, the min and the max. I'm going to go back to the slides for a second. So I showed this here, and this is what I just calculated in R. So this gives us a lot of information, and I tried to write it here. So the first thing that I notice is the mean and the median, if you'll remember from the first classes, are very similar here. So the information that that gives me is that our data is not highly skewed. So we don't have a lot of really high numbers, and we don't have a lot, or we don't have a lot of really low numbers. So our data would look more like that bell curve that we've seen before. So it would be symmetric. So that's what the, we would look at the difference between the median and the median to see that. Um, this just tells you how spread out our data is. It looks like it's very, the short, the middle, and the long are consistently, the data points are about the same amount apart. Like they aren't far apart. That's gonna come up later because um, this is very important. This is what you wanna, would want to see in an ANOVA. It's, it actually is one of the qualifications for running it. And now we're looking at that min and max. Okay, so these, given my domain knowledge that you probably don't have, I know that these look realistic. So the low values were probably a weather event and the high values were a great growing season. But these look in the realm of possibility. So we're good to go on that. So now that I've gone over how to do the descriptive statistics, are there any questions about those in particular? Um, please unmute. Um, I can answer chat questions at the end of class, but I can't go over there to answer um, regularly. Okay, great. Um, so we have... I wanted to show and bring this back to one of the first classes that we did. Um, so I'm always gonna try to tie everything together. So when we're looking at the ANOVA, as I said, the null hypothesis, that's what you assume is definitely, uh, we, we assume that this is the truth until we prove otherwise. So we have to prove this wrong. In this case, um, we are looking to see if our dependent variables, um, if that those means are different across groups. So we want to know if they're different. So our default hypothesis will first be that they are the same. That's how we think of this question. We assume that they're the same or, they, or the sample means are equal. So what we are trying to prove is that at least one of these means is different from the other. Um, and then, as I said, you have to run an additional test to see which ones are different from one another. So that bringing you back to the null and alternative hypothesis that we've gone over at the very beginning of our, uh, our statistics classes. That's what this would be in this case. So if there are no other questions, I can actually go to the chat real quickly. Um, yes, oh, I didn't hear that people were uh, unmuted, but yes, I totally agree. Mute your microphones if there is a problem. All right, so we're going to be running that one-way ANOVA, and I'm going to show you how to do that step by step. Okay, so after we've checked our data, everything looks good. It's cleaned, and outliers have been removed at this point. So this is what the ANOVA code looks like. It's very simple. So our dependent variable is here, and that's going to be yield in this particular case. We want to see how yield differs by growing season. So growing season length is our independent variable. So this is the relationship um, we want to test and see how this is related to yield. 
And then we put data equals after a comma and put that data frame with our data. Um, so we are going to assign this ANOVA model to a particular value. So I made it yield.aob in this case because this will be used very heavily going forward. Make sure you assign this to a, a, a value um, so that can be carried through and we can use that to run additional tests. So to actually print the results of this ANOVA test, we will use the summary function and this will print our results. So let's go in. We are running that ANOVA here. Um, this is base R, so you do not have to load a package for it. Now we're going to print. So I'm going to expand this a little bit. So this is the output of our ANOVA. This is not going to make much sense to you yet, but I'm going to go through every number here and explain what it means. So I'm going to go back, but this is how you run it, and we'll come back to this. Um, and now we're going to go over every single number. So I want to have you understand exactly how this is calculated and what each one of these numbers means. So our growing season. So we see that there's a row of data right here about, in particular, about this growing season. So what does that mean? This row, all of these numbers are going to have to do with the variation in yield um, that can be explained by the growing season length. So we are looking, in this case, at the variation or variance between our growing seasons. So how is the short growing season different from the middle growing season, which is different from the long growing season? So between those groups. So that is what this row means. Every value is referring to that growing season length and the difference between those groups. Are there any questions about this? I'm gonna stop for a second. I can actually go to the chat since I'm not in full screen, it's easier. So if you have anything, you can go ahead and put in there since I'm not in full screen mode. Okay, so the next thing, and then it, this is just referring to the row of values, not specific numbers yet. So now we're gonna go into those specific numbers. Each statistical test that you run with the exception of a machine learning uh, model because it's a little different there. So this is classical statistics. Every model that you ever run will have something called decre degrees of freedom. I went over this with the last um, test that we did, but for, for each test, there's going to be a different definition for degrees of freedom. So I'm going to go over that. The specific formula for ANOVA. So this um, first value will be our first degrees of freedom value. And you'll see how that's that has to do with significance. Um, so if your degrees of freedom change, your how they calculate our p-value is going to change. So for our degrees of freedom of the growing length, it's going to be the number of group levels. So in this case, it's three because we have short, middle, and long minus one. So our three group levels subtract one, that's our degrees of freedom for our growing season length. Okay, so you see that here, and this, this is specifically referring to growing season length. Now we're gonna look at this bottom here, and we're gonna go over more about this in a second, but this is our residuals, and residuals always refer to as some type of error. In this case, we'll, I'll give you the definition of a residual in just a minute. But just as it refers to degrees of freedom, so the formula to calculate this is always the number of total data points, in this case, 119, um, and we would subtract the number of group levels. So in this case, three. So as you see here, um, those that degrees of freedom is 116. So that is how these two numbers are derived. As I said, degrees of freedom usually has to do with your sample size, and it's going to affect this p-value and how it's calculated. All right, so the next thing I'm gonna go over, this is gonna be repeated multiple times and is something that you need to, it's the basis of the entire ANOVA process. So I will go over this slowly. And if you have any questions, please speak up because if you don't understand this, you're not gonna understand the rest of the class. So 
as I said, I'm going to try going forward now that we have some, uh, some experience with statistics to use actual formulas that you will see regularly when we're looking at statistics tests. So in books in particular and in videos that you see. So this is the formula for the sum of squares. Sum of squares is the basis of the entire ANOVA. So when we're looking at this, I'm going to go over the symbology again. So this value um, or this symbol right in the middle here um, is always me means sum of. So when you see this, you know that the thing that is written directly after um, is going to be a sum of all of these values. That'll make more sense in a second. So this N up here rever refers to the number of values in our data set. So in this case, it would be 119. Um, this I equals zero means we're starting at point zero in this case. And usually that means we will start at point zero. The next one will be one. The next one will be two up to the number of values in your data set. So this I you see here. So when you see this X I, that means you're going to go through each individual value in your data set. So that X1 variable will be your first value. The X2 variable will be your second value, so on and so forth. And in that case, you are taking, I mean, we're looking specifically at the growing season length here. So we're taking our group mean in this case. So uh, this, this bar on top, that is referring to our group mean. Um, so, and then we are taking those values, so this would be one data point, so data point one minus the group mean, um, and then we would square that entire value. And then we would do repeat this part for each value in our data set and then sum all of them together at the end. So that is how you calculate a sum of squares. So moving on to our specific example, that's what this means here. So we're going to be looking at the sum of squares, and this is a pretty standard notation. It'll be the sum of squares between groups. So we, again, are looking at this first row here, specifically the one highlighted in pink here. So our sum of squares in this example, and this would go through all 119 rows in our data, we would use this formula, add everything together. And if you did that by hand, which I wouldn't make you do because it would take forever, we would have this output here. So it's calculated for all data points and it, the mean value that would be used. So when you're looking at short growing season, it would be the mean of all short, um, uh, all short observations, the mean of all um, uh, middle observations and the mean of all uh, uh, long observations. So that's what it's gonna show here. That's what will be used here and it will be used for all those data points within the group. Okay, so does that make sense to everyone? Um, we're gonna go on to the residuals in a second and the same formula will be used. But like I said, if you don't understand this, everything else is, you're gonna be hosed. So uh, either put it in the chat or you can unmute your microphones and ask questions. Um, Cause I would really, um, this is very important that you understand this. And I want to make sure that I understand it, uh, explained it in an easy way. I'll give you a moment. If I see anything come up, I will move down to the chat. Okay, so the next part, and this is not, this actual result in R is not listed down here. So you're not going to find what I'm talking about down here, but it will be used in the next step. So. The next thing you're gonna do is the sum of squares of the total model um, in this case. So it's very similar to what we just saw. You go through every individual data point, but instead of using the group mean here, you'll use the mean of the entire data set, all 119 values. So we're still going to do uh, each data point here minus the global mean or the total mean for the entire data set, square it and add them all together. So that's what we're seeing here. And so we're looking at the deviation from the mean. Um, so that is our sum of squares value. And this will be for the whole data set. So the sum of squares and total. Um, so this in practicality looks at, estimates the total variability or variance in our data set. 
So this is not listed down here, but it'll be used in the next step. So what do we use that for? So I've been referring to the residuals down here. Um, so the residuals, I actually probably should have put this farther up, but when we're looking at the residuals, I believe it's somewhere in here, the definition, I messed up and put it in the wrong spot. So our residuals, we're gonna just have to go from there. Um, so our residuals will be looking at a specific, specific value and that'll be subtract and you will subtract the mean. So that in general, no matter what statistical test you're looking at, the residuals will be your value minus the mean whether it's the group mean or something else, it's, it, it varies. So in this case, to get this, and we call residuals error as well. So when you see this notation on websites, they'll often write it like this. So the sum of squares of the error. So another way to think of error is what variation is not explained by the growing season length. So if it's in the residuals, it's not explained by this. And third way to understand this is the sum of squares, uh, the area, the error would be the sum of squares within our groups. So if you calculate the sum of squares within, um, so it's a much more complex formula. So this is a better and more simple way to do it. Um, but it would be basically the variance within each one of our groups specifically. When we looked at the variance between, it was comparing short to, uh, to middle to long. The error would be all within short and comparing those values within the short to one another. So what is not explained by our growing season? So in order to do that, we go back to what we calculated here. So the sum of squares of the total data set, we'll be carrying that into here. And then we'll be looking at the sum of squares be between groups, which we calculated here. So you can go back and look at those if you need a more explanation or you forget what they mean. So in this case, we're looking at our residual error, a residual sum of squares or our error in our sum of squares. So that is how you calculate this. The sum of total sum of squares for the entire data set minus the sum of squares between our groups growing season length. That is what we have here. Go ahead, if you have any questions about this, post it in the chat or unmute. So for our particular data set, we're going to have a, our sum of squares, our residuals is 16,018. So now I'm gonna move on to the mean sum of squares, which should be a lot more simple to understand. So this again, our value, this is always looking at between our groups. So our grow, growing season length, we're gonna look at the mean squared, um, uh, mean sum of squares um, between our groups, between our growing seasons. In order to calculate this, it's very simple. We take our sum of squares between um, which we between groups, which we've already calculated, and we're going to divide that by the degrees of freedom between our groups. So this value, the two value here. So if you take this number divided by the degrees of freedom, you're going to see that it equals 4,908. This is a very important value, and this determines our significance level down the line. So this would be the mean sum of squares between groups. So it's very similar to an average here. So our sum of squares between groups divided by our degrees of freedom, which we see here is two, which is our number of levels minus one, going back to what we've already learned. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna calculate in just the same way is our sum of squares in error, um, it divided by the degrees of freedom of our error. So now you're seeing down here, if you take that one, the 16,018 number divided by 116, it's going to equal 138. So that's how we get this value down here. So this is something that you'll actually see down the line in machine learning, um, it, sometimes in machine learning uh, models. When we get to the more complex things, you're going to see mean squared error a lot in a lot of the different um, 
uh, different statistical tests we're going to go over. You're going to see it in regression. It's very common and it's used across all of data science, actually, not just in classical statistics. So we have that mean sum of squares within groups or a mean squared error. Again, that is the sum of squares of our error divided by our degrees of, degrees of freedom for our error. And that we're going to have 138 there. So finally, we're getting to the significance part of this. So I wanted to explain exactly how each one of, of these are calculated. So going back, and I'm, I actually put this in the next slide. So you'll remember we did the t-test and we had something called a test statistic. And we used that test statistic to uh, then calculate our p-value. And chi-square, we saw the same thing. We had a chi-square value that came out of the chi-square test, and we used that value to determine significance. Here in ANOVA, it's called the F statistic, but it serves the same purpose. So in, in low-level words that are easy to understand, the F statistic, statistic compares the average variability or variance between our groups to the average variability within our groups, so our error value. So that's all that it's doing. You can also think of it as a ratio of our mean squares values. So our, um, and we'll see here, the actual formula is the mean sum of squares between groups. Here, we calculated that, divided by the mean squared error calculated here. So that is how you get our F value here. If you did that, you would find that the answer is 35.54 here. We can think of that as a ratio of the mean squares between groups over the mean squared error, and that would be within groups. So that gives us our F statistic. And similarly to what we've seen in the past, based on our degrees of freedom and our F statistic, there are specific values that will always be outputted for our uh, P value. So when we looked over the t-test, we saw that table. Um, and then we were able to find our T statistic here. I'm not showing you this table in this particular case because it would, it would be a lot. We have very specific numbers in this table that probably won't show up. But luckily, our outputs that result. So there is always going to be the same P value for two degrees of freedom and our F value of 35.54. That's something that is just set. There's no formula, or there's probably a formula, but it's probably very complex in the back end. So it's beyond the scope. But it'll always output this p-value based on this f value and your degrees of freedom. And this was done the exact same way with the t-statistic and the chi-square. If you need review, you can always go back. So we see this p-value down here. Um, so if all of you, some of you might not be um, familiar with scientific notation, but if you see e to the negative 13th or e to the negative high variable, this means that this is zero, uh, zero point zero 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 zero, oh, so on and so forth, very far out to 13 data places, uh, data, uh, data spots, or I don't even know what you call it. So this would be a very, very, very small number, basically, when you think of it in reality. Um, this is pretty much indistinguishable from zero mathematically. It's basically zero. So what this is telling us is that there is, because it's below our 0.05 cutoff, there is a significant difference between at least two levels of our growing seasons. We don't know which ones yet, whether it's short compared to middle or middle compared to long. We don't know that information. We know that at least two of our levels are significantly different from one another. So that is what this, this p-value tells us. In order to find out which ones are different, we have to run an extra test, a post hoc test, which I'll go over in a second. So please put in the chat or unmute if you have any questions so far. All right, so all of that is outputted from one line of code what I just showed you in R. So in order to find out which levels of our variables are actually different from one another, we have to run something called a Tukey's Honest Significant Difference Test. The test. It's usually called Tukey's HSD. 
So this is called a post hoc test. When would you use this? You would only use this after running an ANOVA. And then you want to know if it, it, your value would have to be significant in order to get any information from this test. So if your actual full ANOVA is significant, that is the case you would want to run the Tukey's HSD test. So I will, this test basically takes, it, it, I called it pairwise comparisons. That's what you'll see in the textbooks of the means of each levels of our independent variable. So in this case, growing season length is our independent variable. Our levels are short, middle, and long. So it is going to take um, short and compared to middle. It's going to take short compared to long and uh, middle and compare it to long. So all the combinations of our three variables. Uh, so that's what you're going, it's going to do in practice. Um, and then it's going to run a significance test to see which ones are different when we're looking, we're more comparing each pair from our levels. I'm going to go in here back into the code and show you. So in order to run a Tukey's HSD, remember yield.aov is our actual ANOVA model that we calculated up here. That would be our first argument. We would have a comma and then we would have which equals and then in quotes the uh, independent variable that we want to examine. You're never going to know what that syntax looks like in practice. So remember, if you don't know how what each how to write this out, we would do a Tukey HSD after a question mark. And all of our an example and all the other arguments that you can put in here will show up in this Tukey's HSD. So if you don't remember the syntax, you can always do that. So we're going to run our Tukey's HSD and it's going to print our results. So this will make more sense based on what I just said. Um, so we, by default, you would be able to change this. It would show you how to do that here. Um, it's going to be a 95% confidence interval in this case. So a p-value of 0.05. If you need a review of that, it's on my website. So we have our ANOVA model here. Um, and it's, as I said, going to do pairwise comparisons. So in this case, it compared media, middle to long. Um, this is our average difference between these two groups. Um, this is our lower bound. So our lower bound of our 95% confidence interval. This is our upper bound of our 95% uh, confidence interval. So this is the um, lowest value that you could find where it, if, if it's below this, you're going to have a significant result. Um, if you have our upper bound value here, if it's above this, it's going to be a significant result. So here you're seeing that this does not, uh, this is um, with it, it is, so actually that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so I would have to go back because in practice, um, it would have to be outside of these 95% confidence intervals in order to uh, show significance. So maybe this is something that I'm not understanding about this. So I'll have to go back and I can put in the chat. But so these would be our 95% confidence intervals. I'll have to look and try to explain that in a better way. But you can think of this as the mean difference, for instance. So these might be adjusted in some way. So we're seeing that p value here. Um, and our p-value is below 0 0.05. So that means the middle growing season is significantly different from the long growing season. Okay, so the next thing that we're seeing here is the short versus the long. By default, you would have to think that this is significant because of what you're seeing up here. So the short is significantly different than the long. It's below 0 0.05, and this is the mean difference that you're going to see. Um, so now we're comparing short to middle. This is the mean difference that you're going to see, um, and our p-value is below 0.05. Just because this is something you should do in practice when you're looking at statistical test results, given your domain knowledge, does your result make sense? So in general, in any company, corn is usually going to it's going to have worse performance in the short 
um, it's going to be significantly or, or more, more substantially worse than the middle and the long. So in general, middle and long are going to have a, a smaller difference between one another. So the performance difference between middle and long is usually going to be smaller. Um, when we have that really short growing season, we're going to see a, a worse performance than when we compare to mid, from middle to long. Just when you think about this, this makes sense, given that there's a minimum threshold of light that a plant needs to grow. So in general, that short value is a lot closer. Um, and the difference between short and middle is going to be bigger than the difference between short and uh, middle and long. So what you're seeing here actually would look very similar to my result um, if I had real data, which I do not in this case. But seeing this means that our result makes sense and that I would have, uh, have a lot of confidence in it because it makes sense practically. Um, if you saw something that was very different from that, you would want to go back and check check for outliers again. Um, and then I'm going to go over our assumptions of our test, at our ANOVA in just a second. So you would definitely want to pay close attention to those. So this, given I have domain knowledge in agriculture, this makes sense. If there's any questions, put them in the chat or you can unmute now and ask those questions. Please do. I welcome them. I really, if you have a question, it's almost certain that somebody else does too. All right. So we ran our Tukey's HSD test. So I'm going to go in. Um, this is just showing exactly what I showed before. It's explaining the output. Um, 